How was the Prophet Muhammad as a leader to his people? So the Prophet, peace be upon him, was the head of state. He was the ruler, basically, the president. He was also the military uh, leader. He was the uh, judge. And he would appoint, he would appoint the uh, people uh, in posts uh, in his place, uh, a leader for the army, someone to be uh, a judge uh, and the likes uh, of that. Uh, his style was, uh, peace be upon him, uh, it had a lot of consultation with uh, others and he would consult with the different types of people. As a leader himself, he listened to other people's opinions. He was not a a dictator. It wasn't something that it was a tyrant, the my way or the highway. He actually changed his mind when he heard in the consultations of others. When he had a chance to destroy people, he said, not no, don't do that. He says, give for those who deprive you. Be good to those who are bad to you. Reach for those who cut you off. Do not oppress those who oppress you. He taught us the best of moral conduct as God Almighty gave him that as a wisam al-sharaf. The medal of honor says, wa innaka ala khulqin azim. Indeed, you are the best of character. One tradition says that even when Prophet Muhammad may peace upon him and his successor after him, Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, actually were going to war. He told them the Ten Commandments of War. He says, do not kill a woman, do not kill a child, do not kill an old man, do not cut a tree down, do not kill an animal unless what that suffices for your hunger to be staying alive. Do not burn their homes. Do not invade them at night. And he was asked why we should not invade people at night. He says, you may not wake the nursing child. And you will see those who are worshiping God in their own ways. Leave them to worship God in their own ways. Freedom of religion. Fight only those who fight you. So if you come to fight me, I'll fight you. But if you're not, I can't. Uh, at one time when uh, the, what, what is called in the lifetime of the Prophet, the truce of Hudaybiyah. That is the time when the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him, and the companions, they wanted to perform what we call Umrah. This is the smaller form of pilgrimage, where they visit Mecca and they circle the Kaaba, the house of Allah. Uh, then it was under the control of the uh, opponents, the people of uh, Quraysh. However, the people of Quraysh, they refused that they should enter and they made a deal uh, that they shall leave, go back this year and come back the following year. So religiously speaking, if someone declared that he wants to do this smaller pilgrimage, he has to uh, release himself from that uh, duty by offering a sacrifice and by trimming or shaving the hair. Some of the companions, they uh, did not want to do that, hoping that some revelation will come down which will uh, make that position be changed because they were really, really enthusiastic and adamant that they should go to Mecca and do uh, perform that uh, pilgrimage. So Rasulullah Sallallahu he entered uh, his tent and he consulted with one of his wives, Umm Salama, uh, anha, may Allah be pleased with her. So she told him just go out and uh, have your sacrifice uh, offered and have your barber shave your hair. Don't talk to anyone, just go out and do that. And that's exactly what he did. And Right away, everybody followed suit. I found the interesting part of this segment was the Ten Commandments of War. Those were things I, I had never heard before, and I found it really interesting because, once again, like if you look at it more in um, more in regards to the time period, obviously those things were were huge. You know, like something, for example, like you know, don't poison the wells or don't poison the rivers was something that was common practice in the day and had you know lasting um, lasting effects on an entire area. You know, like if you if you looked at any kind of like medieval conquest or something like that, it's like they would intentionally send in like you know diseased animals or people to like you know give people a plague or something like that. So. Or like, you know, the women and children thing, like obviously at the time it's like you'd have armies that 
essentially we're told to inflict as much pain and, and suffering on people because your enemy was somebody that you wanted something from. It was somebody that you hated, you know what I mean? It was, and, and in this kind of situation, it wasn't that they hated their people that they were against. It was that, if anything, these people were actually trying to deny them something that they thought was, you know, fair for them to have, you know, something like religious pilgrimage is obviously something that everyone deserves to be able to choose how they believe in something, how they act, you know, as long as it doesn't affect someone else. The thing that stood out to me was definitely um, this portrayal of Muhammad being like a dictator and he was um, in the army, he was very unremorseful in terms of how he was participating in the army as a leader and the fact that he went through those Ten Commandments that um, Muhammad was saying in terms of guidelines and different things to keep in mind. For me, um, it just makes me think of the young people that I work with and them experiencing um, their relationship to the Islamic faith and speaking of Muhammad in such a positive manner because I've worked with um, mainly high schoolers um, and seeing them practice Islam whether it be going to the mosque or um, seeing the, and interactions with their parents having conversations with them over the years um, has always been a, an amazing experience in terms of their relationship with these Islam and really them being able to kind of have conversations openly about how they practice and they've also addressed misconceptions that people have experienced or really brought up to them um, throughout the years so I think my interactions and relationships with the youth that I've worked with have definitely addressed and really brought on the facts of um, the religion of Islam and kind of the misconceptions that come along with that. One of the religious leaders was talking about the Ten Commandments of War, which I had never heard of. Um, I think it's, I don't want to say idealistic, but to have a goal of not hurting a woman or a child or um, an elderly person would be amazing in war, but I wonder how much of that was held up, especially when people start to fight back, or how they actually went about ensuring that these Ten Commandments were always followed through. It's very interesting.